Welcome to the final episode of Series 29, everyone. I'm really excited to bring you this discussion about Legend of the Five Rings, one of my favorite games. We really get a chance to dig into some of the great parts and not so great parts of this game in this series, and it was a lot of fun. I do want to remind everybody that if you'd like a different take on this game, the Asians Represent podcast has been doing a read through over on their Twitch stream. We will put a link in the show notes to the YouTube videos of that. It's an ongoing thing. I think they're doing it weekly right now, Um, but you can definitely take a look over there. They have some very interesting takes, and I'm honestly really excited to see their, their thoughts on the game as they go through. With all of that out of the way, here's the episode. discussion episode. Last time we created characters for Legend of the Five Rings. This episode we'll be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back David Gordon Buresh. Do you want to reintroduce yourself for our audience and tell us a little bit about the character that you made? So hi, I'm David Gordon Buresh. I write Dave of the Five Rings, Legend of the Five Rings blog on Cardboard Republic, and I have been covering Legend of the Five Rings as a news topic for more than six years. Uh, I created Togashi Koichi, who was a um, scorpion orphan who found his way to the Togashi Mountain with the assistance of his servant, his family's servant, and now has chosen to pursue a life of justice from the (laughs) shadows. (laughs) <laughs> oh incredible i i love uh l5 r batman he's very good thank you, thank you. <laughs> awesome uh amelia why don't you tell us about your character sure i made kuni tomoe um tomoe is uh more interested in learning about the creatures of the shadowlands than eradicating them they are um, a little too interested in it, maybe, and um, as a result, have a little bit of the Shadowlands taint and maybe learned some Maho. I don't think there's a maybe about it. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I'll never tell. Definitely learned some Maho. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Um, I created Solar Neptune uh, again. <laughs> Uh, Ide Michiru, uh, of the Unicorn family, uh, of the Iuchi Meishodo Master School. Uh, she's a little bit of fighty, a little bit of magic-y, and uh, a whole lot of, um, uh, something, I don't know. Love. Lost, lo- pretty much a lot of love. She's got a lot of love, uh, for, uh, the person that she has a karmic bond with, um, which is Haruka. Uh, so uh, basically she knows pretty much wherever, uh, whatever direction Haruk is in and whether or not she's in danger pretty much at all times, which is pretty sweet. Um, and, uh, she is tasked with protecting the daughter of the great family, uh, Daimyo, uh, who I have named Usagi. Um, of course, after Sailor Moon. Um, and that's kind of an interesting thing, because if you follow the Sailor Moon lore, uh, or the story, um, Haruka actually falls in love with Usagi at some point in the series, um, and that is, uh, ripe for some drama. Uh, so I think that would be really nice if that, uh, found its way into this theoretical game. Um, yeah, so Sailor Neptune in L5R. Yeah, so we've got Sailor Neptune, we've got Batman, and then we have whatever I made. <laughs> the you, one that's probably... You, bas- you basically made yourself. Oh, oh no! <laughs> the one that, did not! 
The one that fits actually best into Rokugan as well. The one that, like, I'm over here making an actual character. It's uh-huh. fine. <laughs> I always go to the... I, I, I fell upon the oldest of tropes of always be yourself, but if you can't be yourself, be Batman. Yeah, I mean, I, that sage wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and dive into a segment that we call D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? All right, in this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. So we're going to get the cliche question out of the way. We're just going to start right off. Can you tell us how you got into RPGs in the first place? How did you end up here? Uh, well, oh boy. So there I was, a young adolescent boy at the age of 12, hanging out with my newest best friend, uh, who had this fun new thing he wanted to introduce me to called Heavy Metal and d d <laughs> And I'm not even joking. Those are actually legit. So when I was 12, my best, my my new best friend, because my dad just got remarried, um, and I moved in that way. Um, Josh Biddle got me playing Dungeons and Dragons because he played it with his older brother, and you know also got me into like metal and electronica, and uh, yeah, that was sort of it. Um, from there, I went back and like after like. A month or so living in that area i came back and moved with my parents and or moved in with my mom came back to my mom and wound up being living in northeast kingdom vermont as like the only kid who played D. so i mm. converted to other kids to playing D, like you do <laughs> and uh that's how i became basically a dm at the age of 13. Well, somebody's nice. got to do it. Yeah. That's what I hear. Everybody keeps telling me that. They're like, well, I guess if you can't find anybody to play the games, you run the games. And I still don't run the games. I don't like running <laughs> games. <laughs> it was easier when we were young. Uh-huh. I'm, isn't everything? Like, you're just so sure of yourself. You're like, I I can do this. I know what it is. I'm yeah. like, you have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> you, but you don't know what oh you don't god. know so that's yep. true that is true <laughs> my oh my god i looked back at some of those stories that i ran and it was dragon lance and it was so i don't even know what it was but it I was found, supposed to be set dragon lance i found an old notebook uh that had my actual adventure scribbles oh, wow. uh written out dialogue oh, wow. and written out scene settings from when I was maybe 14 or 15. That is so cool. And it was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just like blew out my mic when I laughed that hard. But <laughs> I love it. We're like, oh, that's really cool. What a cool treasure to find. You're like, it, it was, was garbage. garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. I, I, I can see through the lens of today how past me thought this is great. And at the time, it was fantastic. But, oh my gosh. Man, I, cr- well, I created my entire, like, sub-mythology based on Planescape and breaking out into, like, concepts of order versus chaos. and mm-hmm. oh, so, so deep on the nerd scale. <laughs> <laughs> what this tells us is that you have grown as a person. <laughs> uh-huh. Fair. Fair. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, like, I didn't start playing until I was 16, but even I look back on that game and I'm like, ooh, that wasn't very good. Like, we didn't know what we were doing. That was not an interesting story. Those were not complex characters. That was, that was garbage. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But we had fun. We enjoyed it, and that's what matters. We did enjoy it. We didn't know better. (laughs) Awesome. Uh, So then can you tell us uh, about your personal process uh, for picking and creating characters in pretty much any role-playing system? Now, am I I talking about picking and creating characters for being a player or being a GM? Because when you're creating a character as a GM, there's an entirely different process, as you are well aware. I mostly GM. Um, I want to say for for actually playing. So... I am a mechanics nerd. 
mm-hmm. in that I love studying how things fit together. Mm-hmm. And so, the, like, the first thing I do when I sit down with a game system is... I, 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 the best way of putting it is, if you've ever had one of those people that you see, like, you put them in front of, like, a clock, and they literally take the clock apart entirely, and then put mm-hmm. it back together, and that's how they uh, that's how they appreciate it. That's sort of what I do to role-playing games. Okay. Um, so I do that. I generally find, like, anywhere from, like, two to three to, like, a half dozen interesting parts of how to get it to work together. And again, these are not necessarily powerful, but they're interesting. They're fun. Mm-hmm. They're, they're challenging. Uh, and then I sort of go, okay, well, that's something cool to have over there. And then I sort of look at what everyone else is playing and go, okay, how do I slot myself into this social dynamic and still have some cool, neat tricks that I can do and how can I help get the story that everybody wants told to go forward? So I generally try to find, I, I'm one of those people if I try to fill the niche and I am almost always play a character who, if nothing else, will push story forward hmm. and will grab the spotlight and shine it on other people. That's awesome. I love the idea of like pulling a game apart like that. I mean, and that's obviously something that we spend a lot of time doing too, is like looking at the mechanics and how they contribute to the kinds of stories that you're trying to tell. I mean, we talked a lot about the strife mechanic and the approaches in this game and what they do for the way that you tell stories in a game. And I love picking apart like the pieces like that. Every element tells a story and whether that's art or a rule or a word, every element of a game tells a story. Either you do it deliberately, and you have a vision of the story, and you try to guide all pieces towards that, or you don't, in which case you get this clunky thing that's rattling down the road at far too fast velocity is probably going to fall apart at any minute. Both of these are fun experiences. Yes. (laughs) I'm not going to yuck anyone's yum. I'm just saying... (laughs) One of these is going to last a whole lot longer down the road. And one of them is palladium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look, I mean, you can't, like, look how long L5R has been around, too, though. And, like, the mechanics of the early games are very different from what we have now, too, and oh, yeah. are clunky in lots of ways that they shouldn't be. So mm-hmm. sometimes and you fall in love with them anyway. <laughs> And in many ways, I say a lot, of the, a lot of the issues with the current iteration is not enough innovation. Mm-hmm. But, um, and, oh man, some of the sins of the older editions. We don't talk about third edition. <laughs> yeah. We don't talk about the third edition. There is literally, for the longest time, one of the lead writers of, uh, one of the lead writers of third edition had up on, like, their signature on, like, various forum threads was, how do you explain Art of the Duel? And their response, it was a dark time for the rebellion, okay? <laughs> there are things you're proud of and there are things you're less proud of Mm -hmm. not not everything is good and and that's just design truth Mm -hmm. how do we think character creation in this game stacks up against other games that we've played it's long yeah it's very very long (laughs) It is long. It is the longest character creation in L5R history. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. suppose, because the other one was a point buy, and so, like, mm-hmm. as soon as you know what the points do, you can pretty easily, like, check, check, check. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to answer the 20 questions. That's true. It was true. optional, wasn't it? Yeah. True. Yeah, this one kind of forces you down that 20 questions, which is really interesting, but... uh. Gosh, it's, it's it, it takes a while. Yeah. This one forces you into a full session zero. And I think it's a game that benefits heavily from doing those kinds of things with your group. Mm-hmm. I think this is one where doing character creation by yourself is it's certainly something you can do. You can mm-hmm. sit down and answer all the questions on your own. Um, but I don't think it sets you up as well yeah. as sitting down and doing it as a group. 
Yeah. One of the criticisms I do have for this, and again, I think that what it does is an amazing tool to do that session zero is there aren't enough prompts in the book to guide that session zero. Mm -hmm. And it's too easy for the party to build a, for the players to build a party that literally has nothing in common mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and has no reason to be getting along and no reason to be going on doing the story together. The, and, the, and it really does put a lot of onus on the GM to sort of no go no 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 we got to tie these people together we got to bring them together we got to have mm -hmm. we got you can have that character cool we're going to take that character from your from your question sixteen and put them in that person's question seventeen mm -hmm. and in so many I have ways a question we, for you about that though do you think that that is a fault of this particular iteration or is that a fault of L five R in general? Because I feel like the way that the clans are set up, that like that's why everybody plays their Emerald Magistrate game, right? Mm -hmm. Or why you play either that or you play a single clan game. Like I have never played in one that wasn't one of those two. And I, so I've been playing. I've played this game for a long time. Um, I've run it for a lot, and you are absolutely incorrect in saying that. One of the biggest problems is how do we get everyone from various different clans together? Mm -hmm. Because you're literally taking people who might be from the same empire, but they're not from the same nation, basically. That's what yeah. these great clans are. They're nations unto themselves. And they, and they ha have, so many of them have beef with each other. Yeah. Like, why would you mm -hmm. have a lion and a crane in the same party? Why would they want to do anything together? Exactly. And that really falls on the GM. Um, mm -hmm. and then the story you're telling. And basically what you have to do is you have to tell a story that's either bigger or smaller than the inter-clan problems. Yeah. And, and again, like, I, like, is this version of the game worse? No, absolutely not. It is, but it's a, it's a problem to L5 RPG. And if anything, I think the full session zero, a GM who has gone through character creation on this two or three times should have the comfort level to go no these are the things that i throw into this my addendums to these questions to mm -hmm. make you have those connections to give mm -hmm. you those reasons to be down bound together yeah i do feel like that's something that's definitely missing because there are a lot of games that we've talked about like they kind of fall in those two categories. The ones that are like, I sit down and I make my character and I bring them to the table and then we would do a session zero. Mm -hmm. And then there are the character creation things where you're asking questions as a group and you're going and you're doing back and forth and you are doing that world building together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this one is doing something in between yeah. where it's it like, I, I'm telling you things about the world. This is what my upbringing was like. These, you know, this is what my parents think of me. Like I've built this whole history around my one little character mm -hmm. and it it doesn't tell like we built three very different characters we'll see when we get to our fan fiction section but like <laughs> our characters have legit nothing to do with each other yeah that's very we're true we're playing three different games yeah absolutely we, we all have our own personal stakes our own personal histories our own personal like lives that don't intertwine in any in logical any sense nope and uh so yeah how do they get together? That's that's that feels to be missing. Yeah. Now there were a lot of opportunities, I think, during the character creation process to add like some similar links. Mm -hmm. Um because that whole like family uh ally section or whatever yeah. uh that was like very uh name one or more people that your character knows and did something for or whatever, you could expand that to like five dozen people if you wanted to. And of course, some of those people are going to be probably related to others or the same people that other people in your group know. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that we could have done. It's not a thing that the game does. does it doesn't guide you there. Yeah, it doesn't guide you there. Yeah. So the game puts a lot of that into question five, which is, who is your character's lord, and what is your character's duty to them? Because the assumption of the game is that you are all serving the same lord. 
somehow. Right. Yeah. Right. But like I said, which brings you back to either you're in a single clan or you're Emerald Magistrates. <laughs> yeah. You could also be Imperial Legionnaires. I guess. I guess. You could also all be one of my, like, again, one of my favorite prompts is congratulations. You're all the founding members of a new minor clan. That hmm. would be fun. Why? <laughs> <laughs> or one of my favorite games that I actually ran, which was congratulations. You're all contestants at the topaz championship and the lion clan attack during the hunting competition and you are the only ones who escape good mm. luck that's a nice happy start yeah I, i've started a game as a topaz at the topaz championship i have not had it be attacked by lion so <laughs> there, there, well there's the ongoing joke of whenever you go to the topaz championship the least important thing is the topaz championship Mm -hmm. that's true i have not heard that adage but that is true <laughs> <laughs> so i i want to say uh that i want because comparing fifth edition to fourth edition mm -hmm. uh directly uh this one seems a little bit more like follow these steps and you'll have a character uh whether or not you have like a theme in mind per se Whereas 4th edition feels a lot more um, almost open-ended after you pick your, your family, your clan, and, and all that sort of stuff in your school. Like, all the advantages, disadvantages, the point buys, it's just like, here's a bunch of stuff. Buy, buy whatever you want, and it'll balance out to whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this feels a little bit more guided and structured and, and I guess, easy, even though it's long. Than fourth edition was. I completely agree with you on that one. Honestly, again, it's like with the fourth edition is very much build your character, then fit them into the story. Whereas mm -hmm. this is build your story, then fit your character to your story. Now try to fit that into the bigger story. Yeah. I do like that it really strongly encourages you to pick mechanics that match the narrative. Mm. So that you're not just pouring points into those things so that you can get your character to rank two by the end of character creation. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to pick <laughs> all the skills, and if I buy one rank in every skill, I'll be ranked two by the end of character creation, and this character will be good at nothing. Uh-huh. Um, so I like that you, you come out with a, a person that has this identity and a little bit of history mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I do wish that it did a little bit more to connect those people to yeah. each other. Mm. And I don't know how much of that it is possible given like your ninja and your geary, like they're, those are very personal things and you're asking yeah. a lot of questions about like this as an individual, mm -hmm. but it, it feels a little bit lacking. Yeah. It feels very traditional in that sense. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, D and D all that sort of stuff. It, it kind of, leaves uh, especially like the 3.5 in earlier editions would leave the how do your how does your group get together uh just up to the whims of the group and the gm uh which that kind of feels like it's kind of come to this as well this edition yeah um which is and i wonder I'm, how much of that is a holdover from trying to like mimic the previous editions right I definitely think I that's know. one of the things that does hold this back, and one of the reasons, actually, I say Path of Waves is a must-buy, because Path of Waves introduces another a set of 20 questions that are appropriate for non-clan samurai, um, oh. and changes a couple of things, like, what is, uh, what, and, like, question four is, rather than how do you stand out, it's what gets you into and out of trouble. Mm. Um, and like part three, like question five is what is your character's past and how does it affect them? And okay. it also has things like a table for sample Geary and sample Ninja. Oh, nice. Which while, yeah, it's really good to sort of have like an idea of what could be there. Like having just 20 sample Ninja right in front of you. 
really does sort of help streamline the process because again, it's just so open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know in the in the current game that I'm playing, our GM had said if you want to wait one or two sessions before you decide what your ninja and your geary are, that's fine because you don't really have a sense of like what the story is or who your character is or mm-hmm. you know like even though you've built them, there's still some of those open ended things of like what what am I really doing here? Yeah. Um, and it's so broad of like what do you want? I'm like, I, Amelia as a person doesn't know that. Why would I know that for my character that I've just met 30 seconds ago? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what their life dream is. <laughs> exactly. And, mm-hmm. and I, I think it's it's also a very different um, mechanic than any other game has. Like, m- there is no other game that has, like, a ninja and a geary that way, too. So to sit somebody down who hasn't played this game before and be like make up these things that are in conflict and you're going to play your story off of them. Ready, go. Like, yeah. That's a lot to ask of somebody. I mean, a lot of games have that in some form, though. Again, again, it's just sort of like World of Darkness has the nature and demeanor system. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, it's just... Uh, and, like, I, I'm thinking of Fate and some of their... Com- like. Ninja and Geary really work like compels in fate systems Mm -hmm. where you have Mm -hmm. these traits that are things that can be called upon you or you can invoke and sort of compel sort of as a blend of either the Ninja and Geary or the advantage disadvantage system. So, well, whereas I do definitely think though that like the concept of this is your turmoil and this will, in, like, you need to build your character so these two things are in conflict. However, mm-hmm. I think is really useful for getting in that mindset of you're playing this conflicted character who is going to break. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who is going to try to reach for these two things at the same time and either fail spectacularly or will actually manage to hold both of them but unfortunately, that means they're connecting the circuit, and now they're going to explode in flames. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fun, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, like, in a cool way. <laughs> Build people. As I as one of the pieces of advice that I gave people with building characters is this. Build somebody who you think would be absolutely miserable trying to survive in a normal world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you build sad characters in this game. Like... These mm-hmm. are not, like, happy, fulfilled people. <laughs> They're not supposed to be. They're supposed right. to be the stuff of legend. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, how do the mechanics of character creation reinforce the feel of Legend of the Five Rings? I would definitely say the fact that it is the... Well, for one, you start with the rings. And mm-hmm. just that, the like, this is your clan. This is your family. This is your school. This is your rings. This is your world. Now, who are you really? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is absolutely hammers home. Sort of, you think in many times you think of your character as somebody in relative to the society before the self. I think you get a good taste of like what some of those approaches are going to look like um, when you are choosing why you pick certain rings or like looking at your clan and your family, like certain families have additions to certain rings and you can kind of see why. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think because of that, like Ninjo and Geary too, you're already getting an idea of the fact that this is a person in conflict. This is a person that like has some kind of internal turmoil that they're working through. And I think running through the questions that way gives you a pretty solid idea that that is a thing that's going to be central to the gameplay. Yeah. What do you think as somebody who hasn't played this game? Oh, well, I mean, (laughs) I get the, um, like it, it really hammers home the importance of the clan family and, and school and, and how that is supposed to completely define your character um, in a way. 
Um, and then you get into the uh, the things that um, kind of positively and negatively affect your character effectively. Um, and as well as the thing, your duty versus your desire. Um, all that sort of stuff kind of tells you that these are going to be characters that are conflicted within themselves um, pretty much at any given time. Um, so that that feels straightforward. The rings um, are emphasized as important. The aspects, um, you can see that those uh, kind of are there. But I think going through character creation itself, the aspects don't feel as important uh, without having played the game before. Mm -hmm. um, it, it like it's harder to see how the rings would affect the way you do things. Right, like, exactly. Like I, okay. like I could see on the character sheet, like here's the here's what the dice mean. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I I can see that the higher value in your rings and the higher value in your skill is going to help succeed. Right. Uh, but not having seen the dice in person mm -hmm. and uh, never having rolled any of those dice before, I have no idea um, like it, how much of an advantage is rank one versus rank two mm -hmm. in a gotcha. scale yeah. um, or, or two versus three in, in one of your rings. So yeah, I can see that. One thing that I also want to comment at is while we as a player, have can have choices in character creation. If you really think about it, the character doesn't. So we choose the clan, sure, as the player, but every member of the clan, you don't have a choice what ring and skills you get. Mm. We choose the family, and that has a little bit of choice. You have a little bit of you have a ring choice, but there are two skills that you don't get to choose. You get those. Mm -hmm. right. Just for being that family. And then you go to school and like, okay, now you have some choices. Now the, now the character can start to express itself mm -hmm. through choice. And if you think about choice in character creation as character expression, mm. there's no choice in Ray Clan for the character. There's only a little choice in um, family for the character and it's not until you reach school where you actually start getting that actualization. You, you kind of just blew my mind uh, <laughs> there a bit because now, now you're going to have me thinking every single system that we encounter when there's an actual choice uh, that could legitimately be my character making that choice in life. Yeah. And, and what path they could have gone down had they not had they not chosen what they chose yeah uh okay I, 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 slight this is the existential way I experience <laughs> I, right but i think it reinforces the like rigidity of the setting yeah right? that like this is you know, like you are part of this family your duty is to this family like this is not negotiable yep and you know like that you are expected to do these things. And so, like, I think that does reinforce that a little bit. But you get to choose um, your school. Right. Well, right. You get to choose their school. As the player, mm. you choose the school of your character. Okay. The skills, you get a choice from a list. The techniques, you get a choice from a list. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the actualization comes in. But like, here's your character saying, okay, these are the things that were important yeah. to yeah. me while I was learning. That makes sense. Yeah. One of the one of the first one of the very first hacks that I've done, and I've hacked literally this RPG to shreds and put it back together in several ways, was to go, This is what the book says your clan gets. Do you? Do you get plus it's like all lion get plus one water? Do you get plus one water? If not, why? How are you an atypical lion if you don't have the plus one water? Mm -hmm. And basically interesting. approach that as suggestions. Yeah, which leaves things like way wide open and and does like make it interesting to say, 
you know, most lion are like this, but I am really bad at being a lion. So actually, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, that kind of would go hand in hand with one of those questions of like, do you uh, value or whatever, what your clan values are, are right and whatnot? And wouldn't it be interesting if you could alter that based upon the answer to that question? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I also have very strong opinions, though, about those particular questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, mostly um, the choice between a social stat, basically honor, glory status, um, versus a skill. Mm-hmm. There is at once that thing of like, how can these two things be equivalent? And in truth, mechanically, they're really not. Right. Because that, and the, the weirder, the weirdest thing is that you go, why would I ever get higher stats and not more skill points? I need my skill points. I need to be able to roll dice. And then we have the curriculum system and why that's a trap. Yeah, mm. when, when we get to our section on leveling up, I have hot curriculum types. Mm. <laughs> I have feelings oh. about it. <laughs> um. We'll get to that. It's it's a thing. <laughs> Do you think that the process of creating a character in this game does a good job of setting a player's expectations for what playing this game is going to look like? Uh, I say yes. I would say very much yes. I believe mm-hmm. it's actually a really good way of setting expectations. Because again, it, it's... It's, these are your mechanics, let's get them out of the way first. Okay, the mechanics are over here. Let's talk story now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of story uh, in the character creation portion. There was a lot of flavor uh, text that I, I I honestly just did not read because <laughs> there was so much. Um, every single advantage or disadvantage had this like little story blurb yeah. before the actual mechanics, uh, which was a uh, uh, a little uh, infuriating at times because I'm like, just give me what does this thing do? <laughs> I, That's I don't. What I said though, it's nice that they all do the same thing. Because... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was nice that it was there. Um, and if I were like wanting to dive deep into the play, I would be reading every single little bit of that and and putting that into my character um and i can see that if you read all of that you're going to get a really good understanding of what this game's about and and how you kind of play this game as your character i think it does a good job too of setting up the flavor of things being in conflict and things being difficult and hard choices that you have to make yeah Um, it it really telegraphs those things pretty well i think yeah and you occasionally come across the really cool ones about like but if the ghost girl with no eyes comes back don't talk to her don't look to her just try to (laughs) ignore her until she goes away (laughs) (laughs) which is like who would write that a very Mm -hmm. tired tori taka (laughs) (laughs) Uh, one of the things that I kind of noticed was that a lot of the choices were one or the other, mm-hmm. black or white. It was mm-hmm. there was there was very little gray in between. Yeah, I could tell you struggling with that um, a couple times where it was like, "Do you agree or disagree?" And you're yeah. like, "Well, I like some parts of it, but not others." Yeah. Like when it came to the question of like, "Do you adhere to Bushido?" You're like, "Well, what if I like kind of do?" What if I mostly like, do? No, this, no, you either do or you don't. Yeah. Um, and I, it sounds like um, playing the game, the the society of Rokugan has this very. Uh, black and white mentality. This is this is from a person that's never actually played. Uh, that's just the feeling I get from uh, character creation. Yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. So, I would say that as the as a game designer, you didn't see the hidden choices, which is mm. you were both a lot of those questions were, are you this thing? No? Okay. 
what about these selection of things? Which of these are you? Mm-hmm. And you have to reject the absolute to get to the gradient. Mm-hmm. And okay. And that's so like the, the, the question of like, is your character a, is your character a paragon of Bushido? If so, get plus ten honor. Mm-hmm. If not, get a rank in one of these skills. Tell us why. Okay, so if like you falter a little bit, yeah, then you kind of get a skill because you're not perfect at Bushido. At, at most people aren't going to be these paragons of Bushido. They're going to have a skill that reflects actually trying to live in the real world. Yeah. And that's choosing a skill off of this list. Tell us why. Okay. And again, the, the presentation is um, a bin- is basically that black and white, that binary thing. But it's actually not. But, mm-hmm. it, but it's presented very strongly as a binary and and again like and i think that's actually one of the one of one of the issues that l5r has is it's very easy to see the world in binary terms Mm -hmm. when in fact you shouldn't right Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think it's a world where there are all kinds of rules but there are always exceptions to those rules Mm -hmm. um and some of those questions make that feel like that's maybe not the case. But I think you also have to remember, too, when you're making that question of, like, do you agree with Bushido or not? Um, you've also already picked your clan and picked that flavor to say, like, these are the kinds of things that my character thinks are important because I've chosen this clan. I've chosen this flavor to say, like, this is the way i want to play Mm -hmm. so you've also already made part of that decision and going back to the honor question i i still again i still have to go back to that point i actually think that if you flipped the order of the choices if your first choice was how does your character disagree with the tenant of bushido get a plus one to a rank of skill of your choice or alternatively, your character upholds Bushido at all times in all ways. Get plus ten honor instead. Mm-hmm. I think that tells a very different story than are you upholding Bushido? Get plus ten honor. Oh, if not, get a rank of a skill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it tells you the expectation. Yeah, that's true. That like this is something that your character is expected to do and not doing that is sort of the other option. Yeah. You know, exactly. Like that, like the default is yes, absolutely. 100%. I agree with Bushido because that is, that is the face that you're putting on. Like nobody would ever be like, actually, I don't really agree. Like between you and me, Bushido, <laughs> mm. what are like, you, you wouldn't do that. Right. Like everybody on their face is like, yes, absolutely. So what a what a great idea. Um so it's putting that out front and saying, like, here's what we expect. But maybe if you don't, I guess here's these other options. Yeah. That's interesting. Like the the actual way it was written kind of uh either intentionally or unintentionally kind of reveals the the uh, almost two faced nature. Mm-hmm. Of uh, people within this world, first yeah. first choice first choice bias is a real thing. Yeah, and I still remember the playtest where the glory question gave you a random gave you a skill at one rank based upon your clan. If you weren't a good member of your clan, which is totally how you wound up as wound up with a bunch of dragon pirates. Because mm. oh. if you didn't agree with the way of the dragon handling things, obviously you should learn sea. Like I think it was seafaring. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. I disagree <laughs> with the. the I disagree with the, the dragon. dragon. I'm going to go be a pirate. Right, Might as well. He's on the whole other end of the map, not even close <laughs> to where the dragon are. I'm sure there's some lakes somewhere. <laughs> Get on a boat. <laughs> a sailboat on a river. Yep. Off we go. Luckily, they river got rid pirates. of that in the, in the main game. That was really only in the beta. Be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. 
Um, so speaking of flaws, uh, what do we think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in the system? Uh, and also what is one of the best parts? Now we don't have a couple hours to think about the perfect <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, I don't love the provided like distinctions and adversities and things like that. I think, I think because mechanically they all do the same thing, then flavor wise they need to be like really bright, and I don't know that they are. Is that the advantages and disadvantages things? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think like I I have built characters in this game a lot and normally picking disadvantages is one of my favorite things in character mm-hmm. creation and doing it in this game I get bored. I I kind of felt the same way. Um because I I was kind of thrilled picking disadvantages in the other game because it was optional. Mm-hmm. Right? It was like, ooh, if I take this disadvantage, I can get more advantages over here. Right. That's pretty tempting. I think I'm going to load up on disadvantages, and then I can balance the points. Whereas this game, it's like, yeah, you're getting two disadvantages. Deal with it. I like what they do mechanically when you're playing the game. I like that your GM can be like, actually, you're real bad at that. You need to reroll. Yeah. I like getting strife for things. Um so mechanically that's that's fine yeah you don't mind having disadvantages and i always feel like that's the part where a character sort of starts to come together Mm -hmm. um the choices in here just feel kind of and i think because you have to pick so many of them yeah maybe because you pick four and then there's like another question where you get another one Mm -hmm. and it like it's like ugh, I've looked through these like ten times and I picked the two that I want. I don't know why I'm gonna get a third yeah. one. Yeah. Like I don't I don't want any others. And I it, there's it it feels very weird because there's plenty of them in there. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like particularly attached to any of them. Right. I don't know. I don't know what the I they I should have had three. What it is that bothers me? They should have had three <laughs> samples and. The rules of make your own. Mm-hmm. Um, so, again, as a uh, as a game design consultant, there's a lot that I would love to say about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I guess now's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we would be here all Listen night. Listen up, Fantasy Flight. <laughs> we would be here all night. Um, what it comes, what it really boils down to is um, there some of the language in this i think very much has a a bias that is problematic Mm -hmm. for one um again like i like as you called out it said like it's expected for you to be this paragon of bushido i actually kind of find that problematic because you're thinking about it makes you think of your character less as a person more as a more as a stereotype Mm -hmm. um so like that is that is just flat out on the ground one of my big issues Mm -hmm. um and that really does inform like how rigid the character creation system is um there's also a lot of illusion of choice one of the biggest complaints I say oftentimes about third edition D&D is it is really easy to build a bad character. It is really easy to build a bad character in this game. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a flaw in any character creation. If it is if a person who doesn't have a degree of system mastery could get lost and build a bad character, that's a bad system. Mm-hmm. Do you like a bad character mechanically yes. or a bad character like interest? Really? Because I feel like the choices are so, you know, it's like, in this question, you get a skill. And so, like, everybody ends up with the same... You have to know what skills to pick. You gotta be able to think about what rings you want. Um, Mm -hmm. The advantages and disadvantages system can be very much gamed. Um, The advantages and disadvantages system is incredibly not flavorful. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's very bland. And again, like by and large, a lot of my criticism comes down to that 
it is too easy to build a bad character, and it's easier to build if you just added a, like a couple choices where where there there were guidelines mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than guidelines rather than guardrails. Yeah. And I think that's that's sort of a lot of the flaws. So. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I, like, I think this is a game, like, you know, we talk about flaws a lot in these episodes, and a lot of times people are like, well, it's not really a flaw, it's just a thing that, like, if it's not your jam. And then we get to this one, and it's like, no, I really feel like this is a flaw, and some of that is, like, I will admit my bias, because it's it's a game that I have done this a lot. Mm -hmm. I have made a lot of L5R characters. There was a point in 4th edition where, like, I could make a character without ever opening the book. I knew exactly, like, what skills <laughs> went with what rings. I knew exactly how many points things cost. I knew what the advantages were, how much they cost. Like, I could do it without ever touching the book. I, I, so, I, like, I have done that at convention tables during Heroes of Rokugan. So, yeah. Right. Right. So, like, obviously I'm coming at this from a very different perspective than I come at a lot of our games where it's the first time that I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, here's what I felt when I was making this character. Like, obviously I'm looking at this very critically. Yeah. Because um, I've it, I've been through it and I know that the things that were hard this time are hard every time. Yeah. That said, what are the good things? Because <laughs> this is a game that I love and, like... Character creation does some cool stuff in this one, I think. You exit character creation with a with a person, with this, yes. uh, with a so much of a realized character that it's almost a shame to try to jam them into whatever game you're going to put them in. But it, you exit character creation with such this fully real. If you really go into all twenty of those questions and you answer every single last one of them. And you think about them like I like we did. Mm -hmm. Oh boy! Yeah, you come out knowing. Did my parents love me or no? <laughs> 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 Would my parents it's just a really big? <laughs> Is my mom okay with the person I've become? <laughs> uh -huh. Right, right. Like, I mean, she's she. You're not where she thought you'd be, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I like that aspect of it as well i also like um kind of just the the basic um for the most part the the actual character sheet itself uh in terms of playing the game uh theoretically in my head mm -hmm. um it it has depictions of the dice on the sheet it has what the symbols mean it has the the codes uh, the seven codes of bushido right on there and it has all of the like stuff kind of right on that first page um mm -hmm. and then if you want to get into the nitty-gritty like details you go to the other pages for your techniques and equipment i like that um it's it's very structured well uh compared to some sheets that i've i've come across before um and and i can tell that if i were to use this i, I would be able to actually play the game because it would say okay well how much dice do i roll well uh, maybe somebody would have to tell me that, but I could read yeah. them now. I mean, you could be like me where you've played this game tons of times and every time you're like, which ones are the black ones and which ones are the white ones? <laughs> I don't remember which ones are skills and which ones are rings. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I see here the skill dice are white and the rain dice are black. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, but sometimes you make yourself an Excel spreadsheet and put your character info <laughs> in there and you don't write on there. That the ring dice are black. I mean, that makes sense. The the the, the ring dice are are red icons on black dice, and oh my god, are they impossible to read? <laughs> and like, as somebody who has who has had a visually impaired player at my table, like, I have. That's another thing I have harsh opinions on. Yeah. But um, for but again, like one of the things you called out the character sheet. I love the character sheet. Mm -hmm. I think the character sheet is incredibly useful because it has all of the approaches on it. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, all in many ways, if you have the character sheet in front of you, all you need to know is, so that number is how many ring dice, that number is how many skill dice, 
you can keep up to that number. Uh, that, right. And that's all you need to know. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So once you have the character, it's really easy to play them. Yeah, that's interesting. I like the fact that with the questions, it's very guided. So, like, as somebody, I mean, it, you made the point that it's easy to make a bad character, but I, I do think that somebody who isn't familiar with the game can sit down and look at this and be like, oh, I just need to answer this question. If I look at this question, it tells me what things I'm picking. Mm-hmm. Okay, next question. Here's what I'm picking now. Like, it's very clear what the steps are to make a character, mm-hmm. which I think is good. As I said, on that subject of how easy it is to make a bad character, Ryan almost exited character creation without a rank of theology as a Shigenja. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> Which means you can't cast spells, or you're just going to be really bad at it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're just rolling your ring dice then. So, like, hope that you don't have a one in any of those rings, because you're not going to meet that TN2 that you need for most spells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I had no clue how that how important that might be. Yeah. Because I yeah. I don't know what those dice mean. I mean, I see the skill dice maybe is that a D12? Mm-hmm. Um and that might has more options than a D6, which is a a, a ring die, right? Yeah, right. For, I'm looking at a square versus a pentagon on this character so sheet. So like in your head you're you're thinking, "Oh, well, like a skill is like there's more choices and but you only get to keep the rings so like and you want more of those and they actually have the same chance of rolling blank that's true interesting uh the main thing is the ring dice has the advantage of having um exploding it has a success and an opportunity base and it has an explosive success that doesn't have strike on it mm. yeah Interesting. Yeah, so skills are important. <laughs> so you can roll. So skill dice can just roll better than ring dice. Okay, that makes sense. Gracious, yeah, not, I would have had no clue. Um, if you wouldn't have mentioned theology being important for uh, Shugenja, I would have thought, well, I'm a Shugenja. Of course, I can cast spells well. Right. You'd think so, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and unless you go and look at the very specific mechanics of each of those spells, you wouldn't know yeah. the rules based off of theology. And I, I would have, I, if I were actually diving into this full force, I would be reading every single skill to see exactly what they do, and right. then I would have known. But just going based upon this, um, I guess that's one of the flaws: is you can't make an ideal character easily without diving deeper yeah. into the mm-hmm. book. Yeah. Whereas a lot of games like PBTA, you you can create a fully fledged character without even opening the book. Right. Uh, there are too many bad choices. Yeah. Yeah. So So on our subject of things we don't like about this game. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. Like I have a podcast called Garbage of the Five Rings, so like this game is bad. Um, <laughs> it's a dumpster fire that we love. Right, we, it, like we 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 may hate ourselves for loving it, but we do. Right, right. <laughs> but a thing that I think that we need to address is that this game very frequently falls into that category of problematic fave. Um, yes, there's a lot of stuff in this game, even though like this edition, hands down, way better, um, yes. way less problematic than previous editions mm-hmm. um, by just. Miles and miles. Yeah. Um. I I guess it, it depends on what edition you're talking about because you're also looking at somebody who is still reading the like early two thousands lore right now. Um. So, this is better. Yes. But there's still <laughs> a lot of stuff in here that is problematic, oh, and I think like we need to talk about that and we need to address it. Mm-hmm. Um. So uh, I want to ask like. What are some things that you think they really could have slash should have done better? I'm going to let Ryan go first, because I could write a dissertation okay. on the subject. Yeah. In fact, read my blog. Mm-hmm. Right. About half of them are... 
Oh, why? <laughs> why? I love you. I love you so much, but why? The the biggest one that stood out to me um, as a person that hasn't actually played before and hasn't really dived into the the lore that much, um, or or the history aside from listening to Amelia's other podcast, um, the the ableism in some of those disadvantages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. was just kind of glaring, mm-hmm. um, especially for for a game that was created, you know, within the last five years. You know, yeah, uh, strong agree. Yeah, and I mean, the the route that they took is, you know, physical disabilities are a disadvantage. Yeah, and that's just the stance they they had going into it, whether it was. That's the way it was in previous editions, so it's expected to be there in this edition, or just a design philosophy that was kind of held over from the nineties. Yeah. Um, as as a lot of people that are familiar with Palladium are well aware. <laughs> uh boy howdy mm-hmm. does Palladium have the uh mechanics. Um uh, like, As we will hear too far yeah. refer to them, the ugh mechanics. The ugh mechanics. Ugh. <laughs> I like that. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this game has some ugh mechanics. Yeah, because um, I mean, the Palladium's a, a game from the '90s uh, and the '80s, and it has the insanity mechanics. It has like full disability mechanics and like all sorts yeah. of things, and it's a staple of games that needs to go away and change um because it's an extremely ableist thing to to just kind of put out into the world especially nowadays yeah and i'm going to add to that we're not just talking physical disability correct like let's go with cognitive lapses yeah Mm -hmm. missing memories um, mm-hmm. I remember for the longest time epilepsy used to be in here as one of the as one of the one of the major issues. Yeah, um, yeah. There's one that's like deadly illness or something like that. Yep. But like when you read the description, it was clearly epilepsy. Yeah. Mm. And, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, also, I'm just going to. Where is it? I was flipping through. Gaijin name, culture, Mm -hmm. or appearance is a flaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So codified racism right there. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yuck. Which, again, okay, your fantasy culture is depicted as racist. Yeah. Okay, that's a problem. And it becomes more so when you when you approach the fact that Legend of the Five Rings. Yes, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room. Please. The uh, Legend of the Five Rings was written by white American dudes for a primarily white, primarily American, primarily male audience in the 1970s. Mm-hmm. I am yes, I am mixed race. Yes, I'm indigenous, but I am also white, and I own that. And I was one of the audience that they wrote for. And in many ways, I still am the audience that they're writing for, even though I've become far more aware of the problematic nature of this. Mm -hmm. They, the, even this game, even this version of the game that has sensitivity readers and Mm -hmm. has these things is still, this game was, built on the foundations laid by Oriental Adventures. Mm -hmm. It was Oriental Adventures when it was owned by Wizards of the Coast. Yes. And this is basically, whenever it tries to be pan-Asian, that's a problem because it's also very Japanese. And Mm -hmm. Japanese isn't pan-Asian. And you can't have it both ways. Yeah. And Asian heritage is more than just clothing, food, and 
phrases in a book. And yeah, it's, it's, this game is still deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. It has gotten better. Mm-hmm. And like the, the L5R, the L5R I fell in love with was, was, was it, it, I look back on as going, oh, 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 why did I love this so much? And it's because of mm-hmm. the community. And I will, I will own that to the day, the day that I die is that, mm-hmm. It's the community, it's the sports fan, it's the love of of, yeah. of my fellow gamers. Mm-hmm. That... Yeah, I mean, and for me, it was, this is the first time I had played a game that had, like, a serious tone instead of something silly. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, like, that's what drew me in, was like, oh, this is the first time I could play a game that, like, told tragic stories and, mm-hmm. you know, like, a very different kind of game. Um, but yeah, that doesn't make it better or okay i Um, i'm very glad that this version of the game has moved to the point where a lot of the codified sexism is gone yes Mm -hmm. um there's still there's still very much like (sighs) kachiko is still a problematic character on certain levels but they've done a lot to try to really they've done a lot they but it's still got a lot way to go Mm -hmm. um and again it's there's there are problems with depicting a Asian fantasy as a violent traditionalist codified culture which worships the this this code of murder basically which mm-hmm. is not what Bushido really is but is on some level with this version we're given yeah. Is this code to justify violence? And that's oh god, that's so that, that's so deeply wrong and just doesn't do justice to these to the beautiful stories that have been produced by these cultures. Mm-hmm. And these rich, amazing histories that that are out there that if this is your gateway to that, like it was for me, go through that gateway. Please, I have wonderful mm-hmm. recommendations to make. And yes, I still love this game, and it hurts me when I love it. And that's probably yeah. says something about me. But <laughs> do you think that this is something that like a future edition could redeem if they put enough work into it, or do you think that like inherently the way the story of L five R works and the way that we understand how to play this game and like what makes L five R L five R will always be problematic like this is a discussion that jude and i had at one point on garbage of the five rings too of like i don't know if this game didn't have 25 years of history and like fan backing and community and lore like if this is a game that people would be like yeah this is okay if this game was made in 2020 as it is as it was it would not be this game could not be made today without the nine without the 25 years and that's a good thing Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and like if it had been made 2018 the bonsai controversy would have killed it oh my god um, yeah and a, a version of Legend of the Five Rings that was made by Japanese voices for a Asian audience even, a, even an Asian American audience would be so <laughs> different from what we have that I don't, th- I, I don't want to say it would be unrecognizable because there's a lot of things I love in this game that I would love to think that aren't bad. Right. But it would be so right. different. Mm-hmm. I would love mm-hmm. to see that game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I would love to see that game. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I think it, it would be different. It would be very, very different from what we have. That yeah. being said, I think that there there is a lot to praise about this game, and I will always say LGBT representation is so good in this game, and mm-hmm. like the fact that the fact that the starting module has a trans or a trans or non-binary, depending on how you wish to interpret it, canon mm-hmm. PC. Yes, mm-hmm. and three three women, three men, 
and then a non-binary or possibly trans or gender fluid, depending on how you wish to interpret what is said about them. It's up to you to determine how that character expresses themselves. It has an it has transgender characters written into the lore. It ha its lead its first fiction had a lesbian who is in charge of a clan, and it, which is basically she rules one of the nations that make this empire great. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And she's so cool. She is so, she's cool. so cool. She's so cool. And given to hot blooded, re sudden reveals. And she's like, yes. I wasn't this random person. I was the Kring Clan champion the entire right. time. Just kidding. You thought I was a nobody. And here I, like, oh, so good. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, the thing is that, like, and I, I, I think in a lot of ways it's so frustrating, right? Because you're like, look, like, you're. You're on the right track. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I think there's some level of like reckoning that I've had to do to say, like, this is never going to be all the way okay. Yeah. And, like, mm -hmm. what do I do with that? Because I do love this game. And, like, there is a lot to love here, but there's a lot that, like, it just will never be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's complicated. Uh, from, an an outside perspective, uh, somebody that hasn't been in in this game at all effectively mm -hmm. um i can see taking like the concepts of the court intrigue the concepts of you know the social battle system the uh the actual battle system all that all that sort of stuff mechanical mm -hmm. stuff um and if you alter the the problematic setting elements get rid of them make the setting better all around and everything um i can i i would still see it as this could be l5r it might not mm -hmm. be roke again right but it's yeah. still it still would to me feel like the same sort of game yeah and i think that like coming at it as an outsider you can say that yeah <laughs> i think coming at it as somebody who has any kind of history with the game like the lore and the story has always been really really important right um i mean and that's the thing is that like with this setting there are novellas there are short fictions released every so mm -hmm. often like the flavor text on the cards for the lcg and like the tournament story decisions and things like that mm -hmm. so to like take all of that out it isn't l5r anymore there is a right. character in an l5r story named after a pc i played in an official winter court game wow and she is that character that i played that's awesome yeah. and that's like there's in in the atlas of rokugan there is a paragraph about a restaurant i created for a story <laughs> that got picked up by the head writer and went that's an awesome restaurant I'm making it canon. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the promise of L5R. Right. Mm -hmm. So, problematic yeah. fave. Yeah. It will yeah. always yeah. be problematic, and I will never get angry at anyone ever for telling me that this is a deeply problematic game. Cause yeah. It is. Right. Yeah. Because they're not wrong. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, I'm looking at the clock, and it's like 11.15. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. Um, we have our fanfic section next, <laughs> um, where we we try and like tell a story with these characters. Mm -hmm. um, is there a story to tell with these characters? <laughs> there, there has to be, right? So let me paint a picture. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll sit back and listen. So the strangest sorts of people get trapped in Biden Pass during a sudden snowfall in the winter. And the situation is that you never really know who's going to get stuck there. It's the most traveled pass in all of Rokugan. It's literally what connects the Northern Empire to the Southern Empire. And it's held by the Yogo family. So you know nobody up there is up to any good. But people get stuck there because early snows happen. 
And when there's a really bad early snow, three people among a small crowd of others get stuck in what is ultimately was a city never designed to be people to stay in. And there are other things there with them. And they're the only ones who manage to discover that for one reason or another, that there is somebody going around killing certain people and taking their faces. And when I say taking their faces, I'm not talking like, oh, it's going to replace them. No, I'm really talking about they took a knife to the person's face and started wearing it, and now that's them. And that's how you get a Ayuchi Shigenja who is trying to, trying to get home to her one true love while protecting her daimyo's daughter, a vigilante Tagashi monk, <laughs> and the Kuni witch hunter who knows too much. Because who else can you trust in this town? Hmm. Okay, well, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I would play this game. Yeah. No, that sounds fine. And I promise I'm not the one stealing faces. Oh, and that's the scary part. Yeah. I would never, ever in a million years set a game in Baden Pass, but, like, that is probably perfect. I have my own, like, strong personal opinions about Baden Pass. <laughs> well, of course um, you do. Because it's a mess. It's a mess. Modern I still have, I have, like, a little sticky note that was on my map um, <laughs> pointing to Baden Pass that says, this place sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my map is not up anymore, but the little sticky note is still on the back of my door. There's a little arrow that says, this place sucks. <laughs> so in the new canon, it's actually a small city. Yes, I know I was reading that in um, in Courts of Stone. I put something on Twitter and I was like, who knew? They probably like have an Arby's or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's, well, that explains where we found the first dead body out back behind right. the Arby's. <laughs> right, was, it, was it Arby's or they do have the meats <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm tired. Rokugan Arby's <laughs> that's where this fanfic went yep Yep. <laughs> you're welcome listeners <laughs> <laughs> alright well okay let's go ahead and get into our advancement discussion and take it up a level take it up a level take it up a level oh boy so right. congratulations. Thoughts and feelings. Congratulations, <laughs> um, my good Ayuchi friend. The good news is, since you re did not take ranks of theology early I did on. Take one. Yep. You can now spend XP in a really efficient manner to get up to rank two. Ooh. Because the way advancement works in this game is a little bit of a little bit of a twisting nightmare of of uh, of um, of a combination of trying of trying to figure out how to best spend your XP while combating both character advancement and fear of missing out. Yeah. Huh. And two characters with the same XP would could wind up being on vastly different levels of power simply because of the curriculum system. Hmm. And that's before we bring in titles. So the way the curriculum is again, this is Dave putting on his GM hat to explain this because you need a GM hat to explain this. <laughs> yes. So the curriculum system is at each rank you have a selection of, I believe, one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven. Seven things that you can spend XP on, which counts full XP. For example, the Aishoto, the Ayuchime Shoto Master can, at rank one, buy any scholar skill, courtesy skill, design skill, Survival skill, rank one water invocations, the invocation sympathetic energies, which is a rank two water hmm. invocation, 
and the ritual cleansing rite. Okay. And get full XP towards this. Now, you can buy any invocation of rank one, any rank one ritual, any rank one shuji. But unless they're on that list, you don't get full XP. Hmm. You have to keep track of those XP because you don't rank up until you have spent a certain amount. Yep. And you only get full accounts for spending them in that certain way. So every level, it's um, a skill group, three skills, a technique group, and a technique. Okay. Uh, not always a if technique, I... but sometimes, usually a technique. Um, and so you have to spend XP on those things in order to move up to the next rank. Well, you don't have so to spend XP you... on those things. Right, right. You can spend XP on whatever you want. If there's a skill you want and it's not in that rank of your curriculum, you can still get it. That's fine. But that XP will not fully count toward moving up in the progression. So is, it only counts is, this, is this the reason why they call them schools? Because... <laughs> Yes. It's so complicated Maybe. that you need to actually like take a class to figure out how to, to school. how to actually level up. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. I generally save up my XP for several sessions before I decide how to spend it because it hurts my brain trying to figure out what I should be spending my XP on. Huh. Now, that's what you get at rank one. At rank two... So, provided you get through rank one, which most people eventually do. So you have to get all of them before you can get to rank two? No, no, you don't have to get any of them. You just have to spend enough XP, and if they're on the chart, you get full XP. If they're not on the chart, you get half. Oh, that's... Okay. So it... Ah! Right, so you can spend six XP on anything, um, but it only counts to three and you have to spend like what is it 24 or something like that to get through the first 20, 20. so if you spent six xp to raise a ring to, th to two you only get half that you only get to count three of that but if you yeah. bought the technique which costs three that also gets you three so now you're at okay. six now so it, it very much like puts you on this track of like things that you could like what your character can look like later in the game which frustrates me because it's like i can't build the like every time i make a kuni purifier it's gonna end up looking fairly similar mm -hmm. if i want to rank up at all and you want that like the rank six abilities that you get are super cool and super flavorful yep. and it frustrates me to death because it is almost impossible to get there Ooh. like so it would take yeah so long and so many sessions to get to that cool ability and i feel like that's where the schools really shine is in that rank six ability the rank six ability by the way of your school is at the end of your turn you may spend one or more void points to unleash the powers within an equal number of may shoto talismans destroying these talismans and freeing the entities within you may immediately perform each of your invocations for which these talismans were created reducing the tn by three so wow you, so you spend like or void and cast four spells. Yeah. All at once. At once. That yeah, that seems powerful. But yeah. you remember remember how your rank one had all those skills. So your rank two, martial skills, still has design, theology, survival, rank one to two earth invocations. Remember how last time was water? Now it's earth. Hands of the tides, well that's water, but it's a rank three water. By the way, if you don't learn that, like, so say, for example, if that was something you wouldn't normally get access to, you don't learn it at that rank. You can never learn it in the future. Hmm. And then artisans. Oh, really? Approval. So, yeah, the fear of missing out is a thing in this. So once you pass a rank, you can't go back. You can't go back. Ugh. Right, so Unless if you don't you spend... take that invocation at that one, you can spend the points on it, but you will still only get half points because it wasn't in that rank. Yep. Is that what that little symbol before the... Yeah, the little diamond. Advance? Yeah. Like the little diamond, yeah. yeah. So that means you could miss out on this if you don't get it at this rank. Well, you still have access to it later on. You just don't get full XP towards it. Okay, so I could buy it for half XP. I mean, half yep. XP worth. Yep. Or effectively yep. double XP... 
Right. Exactly. Now, this sucks, though, when you have a technique that you normally don't have access to, like if you are a shinobi and get access to certain ninjutsu techniques, because nobody gets open access to the ninjutsu techniques. They only get ninjutsu techniques at certain ranks on their curriculum. Mm. Right. If I ever wanted, like, another Maho spell or something like that, I, I couldn't get it, because it wouldn't be... Funny story, I mean, true like story, in fact. You can always learn Maho. It's in the rules. Yes. <laughs> but I'd only get half XP. Yes. Yeah. You'd only get half XP for learning more Maho. Ah. Uh, Which is lame. You should get full XP well, for Maho. Obviously, there needs to be a blood speaker Maho. school. Right. <laughs> blood sp- I, it's frustrating, though, because, like I said, then you end up with characters that like a rank six kuni purifier is gonna look similar always to any other rank six kuni purifier Mm -hmm. because you have followed that same trajectory yeah that same yeah that would make sense it kind of shoehorns you into uh these very small little containers yeah now now allow me to introduce you to the thing that will make this move from the headache into like a an actual migraine. Titles. So when your character has a title, that gives you access to an additional curriculum. This curriculum has a certain, like all other curriculums, it has all of these. So you're familiar with sort of how a curriculum works and how it can change. Yeah. So this curriculum, once you spend enough XP on this curriculum, you get the title ability, such as like an Emerald Magistrate, would you get a title ability for doing it. This Mm -hmm. also can have like those, uh, those like special techniques that you can only, that you now have access to, even though you normally wouldn't have access to. Well, the problem is you can't count your XP towards both your title and your school. So whenever you spend XP, you're choosing which curriculum to apply it towards. So when you get half XP, so say, for example, you spend six XP and it's not on either curriculum, you're only getting three XP. Well, you get to choose which of those two curriculums you get to apply that three XP towards. Hmm. But you can't do it for both. Can't do it for both. So your three XP doesn't count for it like you don't move forward in either. (laughs) Here it is. Yeah. (sighs) Yeah, it's a bad system. It's a bad system. It really frustrates me because like i said like getting to that rank six ability feels really good and like getting those like advanced techniques when you rank up is awesome Mm -hmm. but like it feels it feels like you're just sort of robbed of any kind of choice Mm -hmm. because if you're going to play the game the way that they want you to play you know i mean like you always have the choice to spend outside of your curriculum yeah like that's fine But then, you know, like, even though your starting school ability is, like, treat it like you have ranks equal to your school rank. Yeah. And so it's, like, even your starting ability doesn't get better unless you spend on your curriculum. Yeah. Like, nothing gets better unless you spend on your curriculum. Wow. How do do you get XP in the first place in the game? Uh, It's per session. Yeah, it's per session, generally. Okay. So it's just like, okay, here's three XP for after the session. Yeah. Or yeah. whatever. Yep. Is it is it kind of arbitrary? Like they have a guide that it's like I I think they say roughly 1 XP per hour of play. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it feels kind of arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And like their modules usually have like extra XP at the end things like that. Um as a note, so just for what the ranks are cuz you have to go to page 98 to the sidebar to be able to find that. Um, it is... I have hot takes about the layout of FFG books. <laughs> rank 1, That's... you complete at 20 XP. Rank 2 at 24. Rank 3 at 32. Rank 4 at 44. Rank 5 at 60. So... Wow. Oh yeah, that is a little tiny sidebar. Yeah. So is it is it 24 in addition to the 20? Yes. Yes. 24 more. Yes. Ugh. So, to be a rank 6 character, provided provided you never spent XP 
any way that wasn't counting towards your curriculum, which does mean you literally only have starting rings as a note because nobody has any rings on any of their curriculums. Yeah, that's right. Increasing oh. your rings is nowhere in a curriculum Gross. and it's expensive. So to do that, you will have had to have er, spent 180 XP. And again, you're earning like three or four for a session. You're, you're earning one, one an hour, hour, roughly. It's 180 hours of gameplay. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and granted, like, this is rank six, and rank six is the maximum. So it's it's your level 50 or what you know. Like, it's a big deal. I mean... Um, roughly 45 if, sessions if you play a four-hour session. Right. But it's frustrating because you don't get any other it's not like you get an ability at the end of each rank yeah which is the part that frustrates me like i would be okay with it like i would tolerate it if you got something at the end of each rank but other than like that starting ability of like treated as the you know like the number of your school rank which i want to say that like mine doesn't even have that um i think my school ability didn't say anything about treating it as your school Mm. rank so like ranking up does literally not one of the fixes that i <laughs> threw in for this that i do at a home game is you can't spend xp to raise rings when you go up a rank you gain a ring that's a good rule mm-hmm. and it, yeah mine doesn't say mine is like once per round um oh no it does cap dice up to your school rank wait. so i guess i get a little something like oh now you can keep two dice instead of one mm-hmm. That's, that's Which also wild. keeps from getting some of the most broken stuff in the game from being too broken. Yeah. Yeah. Because once you get a ring of, but once somebody gets a ring of four, it's a completely different game. Right. Because that yeah. allows them to basically go, I critically strike, I critically strike, I critically strike. Because I'm keeping four dice, which allows me to get the two successes to hit and the two opportunities to critically strike. Oh, interesting. Right. Well, and most spells have a TN of two, and so when you're keeping four dice, your likelihood of being able to do any of those things yeah. like ah. is much, much higher. Okay. So, and that again, like, sense. I see what they were trying to do with the curriculum system, and again, like, I think on some level I, their intentions were good. They mm-hmm. they wanted to give that feel of incremental growth. And that idea of school secrets versus real world knowledge and how are you going to value these and where, what mm-hmm. are you going to do? I just don't think they succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, and better minds than mine can think about like what would have been better to do that. Cause like, I can't, you know, yeah. I, I try not to like be hard on things if I don't have a better solution to just be like, this is bad. Um, I, Cause I don't personally know what would have achieved that, mm-hmm. but like, this this ain't it. <laughs> yeah. Personally, I think a better way of doing it would have been a discount on buying stuff. Yeah. Like a 1 XP discount, because your minimum spend on something is 2 XP. So whenever you buy something off of your list, you get a 1 XP discount. Once you've spent 20 XP, you go to rank 2. Um, I think a lot about the curriculum system. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a huge frustration for me. Like, it And I haven't played a game long enough to really get that far because my games keep falling apart. Um, But every time I look at it, it, like, hurts my brain. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, again, like, I still don't, I I don't even know the answer to. So what if I'm at 18 XP and I spend three? Do I go to rank? Well, what happens to that one XP that's left over that I spent? Oh, that you spent over rank two. So does it go to rank three? But you didn't spend it on anything. So do you get a half an XP? <laughs> like, <laughs> or does it just oh. go away? Does the emperor tax it? Oh, which is a reference yeah, to like, the which is a reference to the old card game, which it was because there wasn't like there wasn't basically mana pooling. You just yeah. spent money to buy things, and if you had any extra, well, the emperor taxes it, and it just goes I away. Guess. Uh, Goodness. Yeah, and again, like, so, and the mastery abilities are amazing. They're so cool. Like, they're so evocative and interesting. And, like, I just, I want them. But who plays for that long? The social yeah, illusionist one is so awesome. Of the, I said, 
you could just spend a void point, and it turns out this one thing was always your illusion the entire time, and you have to dramatically reveal that you were casting this <laughs> illusion the entire time and had everyone fooled. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, they're really cool. That's amazing. They're really cool. Yeah, that's it. It's forty at least forty-five four-hour sessions. Yep. Right. Uh, as if as you suggestion. Spend perfectly along the curriculum. A yep. year's worth of work if you're playing every year, every day, every week. Ugh. Yeah. So the problems don't end at character creation. Is what right. I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, that's a way of putting it. <laughs> It's a complicated game. Yeah. I mean, Palladium's more simple than this in terms of leveling it up. It is not. You're <laughs> garbage. I don't want to hear it. It's kind of true. In the, in advancement, Palladium yeah. is more well, simple. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> it is not. Where you have to write down the percentage because each skill advances at a different percentage. Yeah, but it's all right there. Where you got... Depending on where you got the skill from. Yeah, but that's why you, you have to remember. Like, did you get it from this skill package over here, or did you pick it up later? But the character sheets point have point. you plus the percentage per level that you write on the character sheet, so you just know. <laughs> it's mindless. Yeah, you can write down the curriculum. This makes you think too much. It's right in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got too much. If, yeah. I, if I need a spreadsheet to level up. I'm sad. You need a spreadsheet to track your experience spends to know where you should be. I know. And it's it's, oh, it's, goodness. it's a bit of a nightmare. And yeah, that does seem yeah. so. And it, it feels like it would be very difficult to reverse engineer if you lost that. Oh, it is. I had to do it once. Yeah. Like, literally, I, I lost my XP chart. I had a, I had a character that was somewhere between rank 3 and rank 4. Um, I was, I was a Shigenja. Like we started at, we started at, this was your starting XP and I spent it in perfect, like perfectly to like, didn't waste a single point. Um, and yes, there were have experience moments cause I bought some rings, but, and then I had to, and then I lost that sheet. And I had to figure out where I was between ranks three and ranks four. Oh, no. And I had to retro, like, I had to reverse engineer the growth of my character by spending XP, knowing the, only the XP total. Wow. And my curriculum. And it was, yeah. it was like, Ugh. how did I do this? Yeah. And th this is where one of the traps of character creation comes out, because it's actually better, mechanically, to not take skills during character creation. Hmm. Because ev most of them are at rank zero. Mm -hmm. Almost all of your skills that you get during character creation are going from rank... Oh, because it's more expensive so, to do it at two. But yeah. also... You want to spend XP at the right time to get full, to get it to count towards your rank fully. So it's something like you have to plan your XP spends in advance and go, I'm not buying this skill at this rank. I'm going to wait until I hit rank two before I spend my XP to buy this skill. So I don't want to actually start upping this skill quite yet because it's not the most XP I can get mm -hmm. for it towards my curriculum. Yeah. Because uh, I was looking at theology, that's that's rank two for me, yeah. and I was yeah. like, I gotta wait until I get to rank two before I can like feel good about upping my theology. Mm -hmm. Right, but if you hadn't taken any at character creation, you'd only be upping it to one, so you'd only be spending like three XP on that yep. instead of like six or whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. yeah. Curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> that's fun yep all right well is there anything else that we wanted to discuss about uh character advancement or character growth um don't buy it... bonds <laughs> <laughs> so there was a mechanic that was introduced in courts of stone which is basically an advantage system that you can create that you can spend XP on to create relationships 
between you and other characters. And if it's another PC, you both have to spend the XP. But if it's an NPC, it's you have to spend the only one of you have to spend the XP. And for every Why rank, would you ever do that? What? Why would you ever do that? Because you want true love. You can buy true love with XP in this game. Wow. Yeah, but like, why can't you just have a conversation with your GM and be like, hey, GM, I would really like this story. Because I want the ability to share void points with my true love, no matter where they are in the world. So long as they think of me, I can share me, share them my XP. Wow. Mm. So it's, you mm. never know it's true unless you spend that XP. Exactly. <laughs> Or a true <laughs> bond of brotherhood. <laughs> That's how you know it's true love is if you're willing to spend XP on uh -huh. <laughs> so it. Was this game That's backed by the divorced. diamond industry? I understand now. Wow. Didn't spend enough XP on my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Too real. Oh, things got real. I love the bond mechanic. I hate that it costs XP. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, well, okay. There's a lot of things. Guard that XP with your life. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not on anyone's curriculum yet. So, I, I would say about halfway through uh, this recording, you had me really wanting to play this game. Uh, but now I'm like, yeah, but... For a one shot, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful for if you have a pre built character. It's really wonderful if you're playing a one shot. Um, I have, I have literally torn down the beginner set to the to the to the core rules, and rebuilt it, complete with character creation, and it works. Nice. The core engine of this game is really good. Mm -hmm. The the approach is the good strife, bones. The, Yeah, is so good. And it says a lot that this game is this much fun, despite all of these really broken pieces that somebody has welded onto this like it's a Mad Max machine rolling down the highway. That's very true. And Yeah, this is one of those things where like it's a piece of art and you're like, you should have known when to stop. Like, here was good. There are a lot of elements in this that, it, as somebody, again... This is something that I look at and go, this game was rushed. Mm -hmm. uh, it needed about another six months of gen uh, of 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 a play test where they had the where they had to answer some really hard, really bad, like really hard questions. Mm -hmm. um, the play test they had was very directed on certain questions, a lot of balancing um, certain techniques and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the core of the game is really good. It needed more playtest. This is a game that I would say I, I, I want to see another edition of this game by FFG with all of the mm -hmm. lessons that they have learned. And, and we have yeah. that in many ways in Path of Waves. Path of Waves yeah. is a substantial improvement on the core rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot in there. Interesting. Well, one day I will eventually play this game. Yes, someday. Um, <laughs> at, at some point, I'm sure that Amelia will drag me into a game at some point and and say, all right, mm -hmm. you're finally going to play this game, and then you'll understand why I like it so much. You can see what the fuss is about. I'll see what the fuss is about. Run towards the... <laughs> Set the ship on fire and then run onto it to save lives. <laughs> Yes. I'm all for that. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us uh, to talk about Legend of the Five Raidens um, <laughs> and the uh, somewhat of a dumpster fire uh, that it can be, but but also the, the diamonds that are left over um, after that fire is done burning. Um, can you remind everyone where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? So you can find me on the Cardboard Republic under Dave of the Five Rings, where I publish monthly blogs about the what has happened in the last month um, for Legend of the Five Rings. You can also find me on Twitter at SMDWURKS Soundworks, uh, where I tweet a lot about, well, Legend of the Five Rings and political activism. So mm -hmm. be aware. 
Well, thank you again for joining us. This is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning, or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune, or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Campaign. Campaign is an actual play podcast exploring lawn form role-playing. The current campaign, Skyjacks, takes place in an original setting inspired by the music of the Decemberists, folk tales, and classic adventure fiction. Join Liz Anderson, John Patrick Cohen, Tyler Davis, Johnny O'Mara, and Game Master James D'Amato, as they tell a tale of daring sky pirates. Also, it's basically an elaborate retelling of Weekend at Bernie's. Just search for Campaign or James Tomato on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. I am recording. I, I've got a lot of vocal fry right now on that clicky. Uh, clicky. You know, I didn't know what vocal fry was until late last year. Oh, really? Yeah, I had no idea. That's because people don't accuse men of it. I know. Well, it was uh, because Addison Peacock was talking about it on uh, one of her podcasts. It was either Horror Borealis, and I was editing, or it was uh, something that she said on uh, Crypto Keeper. And I was like, what is this vocal fry? I, I don't get it. So and I why actually, are people so I actually, freaking why, upset about yeah, it. Yeah, why are people so upset about it? Like, what the heck? It's not feminine, apparently. Well, I like it. I just do it. Like, I don't. It's fine. Right, but it's it's just a voice. It's, yeah, it's just a thing that voices do. But apparently, yeah. it's not feminine enough, or wow. whatever. Uh, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> uh, all right. I'll do a five count and then I'll get started. All right. Sounds good. Welcome back, everyone. It's been a long but short but time. What is that? Say, Ryan. <laughs> time doesn't mean anything anymore. Two weeks off. <laughs> <laughs> a long but short but time that doesn't. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to start over. <laughs>